verse we start talking about, talking to us and telling us about Jesus. All right, and uh, appreciate the chance to get up here. So you thought you thought you had it bad coming here talking about dairy? Yeah. I'm talking about sheep and goats with a bunch of cattle people. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> so. I do know we have a few small room of people in here, but most of them, I'm sure, assuming are going to be either beef or dairy. Uh, I'm also in the situation of, I know most of the people talking today are either economists or forage-based people. My background is quantitative and population genetics, so I'm kind of off offbeat on that as well. But small ruminants is one of those areas that over the past several years has started to get more and more interest in the state and throughout the nation, uh, especially in the goat business. Uh, the realities with goat production today in the United States is when we look at the amount of goat meat consumed and the amount of goat meat produced, we're importing still a little over half of the goat meat that's consumed in this country officially. There's no measure of what's processed on somebody's farm, so we're, we've got to go with what's being processed. So that's one of the reasons why when people look at that market and they look at how that market's been doing, it's been fairly stable over the last several years. About the last 10 years, it's been really stable. And that's because there is a continued growth in demand without a corresponding increase in overall productivity or production. So we're having this import issue. But just like a lot of other things, we've got to be able to make money at it if we're going to continue to be in that business. Uh, as a professor, one of the things I keep telling my students is everybody likes talking about sustainability. Whenever I read the definition that USDA gave of sustainability, the first thing they said is it has to be economically viable. And I have a lot of people talking about sustainable production that is not economically viable in the long run, but because it fits some other aspect, they swear it's got to be sustainable. I don't care what business you're in, if you do not break even most years and make a little money sometimes, you're not going to be sustainable for very long. So we're going to talk some about small ruminants and turning grass into cash with them. Uh, so I wanted to start out making sure we're all on the same page. Of course, when we talk about small ruminants, we're typically talking about sheep and goats. There are some people out there that will use add alpacas and llamas to that group of small ruminants. Pretty much anything smaller than a beef cow, they consider to be small ruminants. Their digestive system is basically the same as a cow's. They've got the rumen, they've got the whole ruminant system, rumen reticulum, abomasum, omasum, uh, omasum, abomasum. I've got them in order when I talk to students. You know, so they still have that fermentation vat. They still require a lot of forage, a lot of fiber in their diet to be productive. But that system is smaller than it is in cattle. And that's important to remember whenever we're talking about this because as those nutrients pass through, they tend to pass through faster in our sheep and goats, especially in the goats because it even has a shorter, smaller system than the cow, than the sheep. And because of that, you may have some really good grass, really good forage, but if it passes through too fast, they don't get the nutrients out of it. So that's one of the reasons we really have to do a good job of managing our forages, managing our systems. They're able to graze closer to the ground. That was part of the reason for all the old range wars you hear about in the movies and everything in history where the sheep and the cattle producers hated each other. Well, the sheep would come through and they'd graze it all down to the ground and not leave anything for the cows. They can graze shorter because of their mouth. They're also a lot better at being selective in what they graze than cows are. And I know there's a lot of research that shows that cows are more selective than we think they are, but I've never seen a cow be able to pluck the leaves off of a rose bush without getting the thorns. And I've watched goats do that. Okay, I can't pick a rose without getting thorns stuck in my fingers, but I've watched goats eat the leaves off of a rose bush and not get a thorn in their lips. So they are very selective. They can be very selective. And in general, they also require a little bit higher quality diet because, again, of that smaller size. They've got to get all of that. They have, don't have the time. The stuff passes through quicker. They don't get it all absorbed as easily. So, does size really matter? Well, smaller ruminants, we can have that higher carrying capacity when we start talking heads per acre. Okay? Why is this something that I want to bring up? Well, 
Those of you in the state of Kentucky, I think you realize that we're getting a lot of places that are getting smaller and smaller. We've got people out there, and I've had some of them come and talk to me. They just bought 15 acres, a 15 acre farm, and they're going to run cattle on it. And they want me to tell them how to make money running cattle on 15 acres. It can't be done. Okay, we can talk though about sheep and goats where we can run a lot of times three to five head per acre versus two to three acres per head in the beef industry. So when we get those smaller acreage, we can get enough animals and sheep and goats to be able to divide those fixed costs to get that down to where it can be a potentially profitable unit. And like I said, the problem is we have a lot of people, they want cattle, they're used to cattle, they've seen cattle, they haven't seen a lot of these others, and sometimes they're not prepared for them, but size does matter. They also have different preferences for forage than cattle. And this will be something I'll talk about more later in some different things that we can do for them. I've not seen a cow, you talked uh, talk about grazing some annuals, uh, talked about grazing corn. I actually turned cows out on standing sweet corn in the hard dough stage, some goats out on this. They did not touch the corn for about a week. They ate all the weeds out of the fence line first before they got into the corn. They ate the multiflora rose, they ate the bush honeysuckles, they ate the blackberry brambles. When that was all gone, they hit the corn. Did real well on it. They ate the pigweed too. They really like smooth amaranth. They'll even eat spiny. Not quite as well. So, you know, they hit some of this stuff versus the standing green corn that as somebody coming in would have said, well, they're going to go to that and they're really going to hammer that. I've got to watch and make sure we don't founder them. They took care of it themselves. But this is learning and knowing the differences in what they prefer and how we can utilize that. Alternative grazing practices, locations, these are possibilities. We get into using them for grazing invasive species or land management purposes. We can use them to help clear out areas. Uh, I don't know, again, I'm sure everybody here has got perfect pastures. They don't have any areas that's got weed encroachment. You know, you don't have the piles of multi-floor rows and the draws full of other stuff going on. I mean, that's why they're here. They're good, good producers. The ones that need to hear all of this stuff are the ones that never show up, right? But goats can handle some of that stuff that others don't. So that's one of the things when you look at them for co-grazing. And just like beef cattle and the dairy cattle, proper grazing management is critical to the success and profitability in a grazing system for sheep and goats. We need to be looking at doing a good rotational system and having a good planned grazing program, looking at some diversity in our forage so that we can maintain their needs and meet that over time. So when we look at grazing preferences, I've, I've seen a number of studies that were done on this, looking at cattle, sheep, and goats. Uh, one of the big things I've seen is, just like most studies of this type, every one you get from somewhere else has a little bit different numbers. This is one of the older ones. It came out of Texas. The reason I point that out is grass isn't always readily available in Texas, especially in the hill country of Texas. Uh, but if you see here, cattle really like the grass. They don't really like that much browse. None of these species, I'd say, are really going to go after what they classified as forbs, but that could be the type of forbs that were available at that time when we start looking at some of these broadleaf weeds. But sheep weren't quite as big on the grass, but goats were fairly well balanced between browse and grass. So when you give them the opportunity, that's something that they're going to prefer to graze if it's out there and available to them. Whereas cows, if they have the chance, they're probably not going to graze a lot of blackberry bushes or multiflora rows and these types of things. I know people who've said, I can get my cows to eat it. It's like, yes, you can get them to eat it. But is it something that they want to eat? Is it something that's going to meet their needs? Whereas when the smaller ruminants, you can get there and they can do this. 
So we use that to our advantage as we plan our grazing systems. That difference in diet space, different types of forage, different availabilities. It's also opportunities for producers. We have at least two peak companies in this state that I know of that are actually contract grazing because of this. They're running goats. They've got people paying them to run their goats to get rid of some of the invasive species in parks along utility right-of-ways and other types of areas. It's a lot more common out west than it is here. There's also some places out further east, but it is something that some people are doing. It's a hard sell. Both the people I know doing it, so they say, yeah, there's a lot of people interested and they really want it, but they don't want to pay me for it. Okay? It's not a business if you don't get paid for it. But it is an opportunity that increases and utilizes some of these other areas that you don't think about. That's one of the problems I have today. Since I really started working with goats, I have a trouble driving down I-75 south. Okay? I have trouble coming out this way and going south, coming west. You start going, you start seeing the amount of kudzu on the side of the road. You start seeing the bush honeysuckle on the side of the road. It's like, man, we really could use some goats out here. Okay? We can do a lot with this. And there's a lot of area that could benefit from goats. Sheep will do a similar job. They're not quite as good at some of this as, uh, as, as the goats are. So when we talk about managing forage, all those same practices of rotational grazing, annual forages, Diversifying your forages are very effective in improving the performance and profitability of your goat herd or your sheep herd. The big difference I see between cattle and these is related to our fencing. I have yet to find a barbed wire fence that will keep a goat or a sheep in. I grew up in Louisiana. We used barbed wire fence all the time to keep cows in. I worked out in Kansas. Three strands were all you needed, barbed wire that was a legal fence, your cows usually stayed in. You're not going to keep sheep or goats behind barbed wire. However, good woven wire fence will keep them in. I actually know some producers in this state that are using high tensile fence to keep sheep and goats in as their perimeter fence. They've got a really good fence, a really good charger, and it's set up well, and their animals are trained to it. And what they tell me is if they have one that doesn't like staying behind the electric fence, they put it on a trailer and it's no longer a problem. So you can get them behind. You don't have to spend huge amounts of money to keep them behind fence. The predator, remember the size of the animal, okay? Coyotes love animals that size. They're very vulnerable. Uh, one other consideration is grazing pattern. We've done some work. Goats have a tendency to spend a lot of the day resting, so they spend less time, a lot of times, out there grazing. Depending on that predator pressure, they may or may not move at night. One of the other things I've seen, you see this little picture down here? I was trying to get it as big as I could without blocking other stuff out. We had some forage sorghum. The same thing, you know, this was actual forage sorghum, but sorghum sedan grass would be the same. The problem we were having is we turned these goats out there and all they were doing was kind of nibbling on the edges. They weren't really going in at all. I was really beginning to get worried they were going to sit there and start going backwards on me because they weren't eating the forest that was available. I had somebody tell me, he said, you know, they did some of this work before and the goats really didn't like getting into that forest because they're a prey species and they couldn't see. You see this little green right there? I took our John Deere gator and started driving through the middle of that. And the goats were just following me like if it, it was a trail. So I took the picture. The goats got in there. I crisscrossed that field. The goats hit it, and they started to get ahead of it. So you've got to be aware of some of these things. Because they're such a prey species, they don't like getting deep into something where they feel more vulnerable. So you have to think about that when you're planting the grazing with these. Mixes of cool and warm season forages, just like with the cattle. We have the summer slump. We have fescue issues as well. Uh, both annual and perennial, perennial forages can be used properly in these systems. 
And I know I'm not the only thing between you and lunch, but I have been told y'all are supposed to have a business meeting before lunch, so I don't want to put that too late. And... Okay. All right. When we talk about fencing for goats, I've heard everything from if it'll hold water, it still may not hold a goat. Uh, woven wire field fence works very good for goats uh, as a perimeter fence. We have a lot of people that go out there and they spend a lot of money buying this 4x4 four four square fence. It's usually about twice the cost of regular field fence. We use 12 inch wide stays. So there's the square is 12 inch wide or the rectangle is 12 inches wide, standard height. What I found in our farm at the university is where we have that fence, if a goat gets its head through that, it can, has enough room to get its head back out unless there's a post there breaking that area up. Okay? The big problem with these smaller square fences, the, six, the eight and six inch standard field fence is goats of a certain size, if they've got their horns on them, they'll put their head through there and they can't get their head back out. And you've got goats with their head stuck in the fence. And if you're in a location like we are, all of a sudden, the people in the neighborhood are calling the farm manager at 2 a.m. saying you got a goat caught in the fence you need to get it out now, and that's not real pleasing to that person, so they're upset with me. So that 12-inch stay really works good. The standard sheep fence, you know, standard size woven wire because sheep don't have horns are fine. Dairy goats that people see are dehorned. That's why they don't have horns on them, just like your dairy cows, okay? And they're dehorned for the same reason. You handle them so often. Most people with meat goats don't really bother to dehorn them. It's a bloody process, so they don't do it. Electric fence, high tensile fence can be effective, usually a little bit lower spacing, lower to the ground to keep them from going underneath it, but a good electric fence is very effective. I like using a standoff wire around those woven wire fences, and I get two purposes out of that. Number one is goats love to rub on that fence during the springtime when they're shedding. And it's amazing how quick they'll push staples out of your fence post and pop the wire ties on your steel post. You put that electric standoff wire on there, they don't rub on that fence anymore. They also don't stick their head through the fence anymore. Just under my knee height, so usually about 20 inches is good. 18 to 20 inches. You're probably aware, if you think about that, stuff starts growing up into it, so yeah, you have to do some maintenance on it, but that's for anything. The other purpose about that, remember I said you really need to consider using rotational grazing. I'm a firm believer in using temporary electric fence for rotational grazing, because I can vary my sizes, I can vary my shapes of my fields as I break that up into different paddocks. That electric standoff gives me a good place to tie into to power that electric fence. Okay? So, a lot of people use this electro netting fencing. We used to use it a lot at KSU. Then I got lucky, and the Gallagher rep was there one day and said, Why are you fighting that stuff all the time? We've got a product that's a whole lot better. It wasn't available here in the state at the time, but he made arrangements for me to get some, and I've never bought another roll of electro netting since. The uh, problem with electro netting is it gets tangled. You got to pick it up right. It's heavy, it's bulky. We use this Gallagher Smart Fence. I don't like talking about name brands, but Gallagher is the only company I know that makes this e equipment right now. Uh, it's four strands of polytwine on reels that are combined on a single system. It's got 10 step-in temporary post, and it's 300 feet long. So we put the first post in, we start, we crank the uh, tension down, we start backing up, we run it wherever we need to go, putting post in periodically. If we need to make a corner, we make a corner. When we get to the end, we tie the, the main post in, crank the uh, tension back down, turn the handle, and each strand is on a separate wheel, so we can tighten each strand up to the right tightness to keep it good in good shape. 
if I don't need the full 300 feet, it's not a problem. With the 300 or 164 foot poly net, if I don't need the whole 164 feet, what do I do with the rest? And like I told somebody else, my biggest problem, that's one deal, but I you always wound up sitting there with a situation where I'm running straight across a field and I need six feet. So I need six feet and the shortest they make that poly net is 80 foot. With this, yeah, I'll use a 300 foot strand, but I can at least keep it tight and keep it together. So we like using the Gallagher Smart Fence. I've also used two to three strands of just plain poly twine on regular wheels, like you would set up a single strand for cattle. Again, I'm real precise in my measurements. I show people about this part of my, you know, about halfway up my calf, right underneath my knee and right over my knee. And if somebody likes to jump, we throw them on the trailer and we send them somewhere else. I've yet to see the processor complain about one that jumps, okay? And I've yet to see it be a problem after it goes to visit the processor. Folks, I deal with too many people that the animals are more of a pet than an actual production thing. And so this may sound funny, but a lot of times they deal with that and they keep putting up with it and putting up with it because it's a pet. And they don't want to admit that it's a pet. Yeah, I know. But cows are a whole lot bigger pet. <laughs> but the electric uh, fence, especially the netting, can reduce the risk of predators as well. They don't like getting hit by the electricity either if it's got a good charge. One thing I will warn you about electric fencing and goats especially, but sheep as well, I think they're able to predict when the power goes out. And they're standing there waiting, and as soon as it goes off for two minutes, they're on the other side. Uh, I have literally watched goats with electro netting in a field graze and ease in toward that fence and stop, look at the fence, and start grazing back away from it. When the fence was off, they grazed up toward it, stopped, and kept going into it. Okay, I don't know what they're sensing, but they are better at this than cattle are, and if you turn that fence off, a lot of times they will get out if you leave it off. So how do we use them in a grazing system? One key to profitability, like I mentioned before, is rotational grazing. We've got to do a good job of rotational grazing. We've got to have a good system in place. if we're going to be successful. This, as has been mentioned before, keeps the grass vegetative. Vegetative grass is more nutritious. We need that higher nutrition. But one of the other keys with small ruminants is parasite problems. We have a lot of problems with internal parasites with sheep and goats. That parasite has a life cycle outside of the animal. And it takes 14 days to go from egg to an infectious staged larva. So whenever we're grazing and our grazing periods get extend beyond 14 days, we're reinfecting animals off of that pasture. So with a good rotation system, we can keep that rotation quick enough to get them off of that field in time. Again, temporary fencing is real critical to this. Woven wire that meets the ground is important. Goats do like to go underneath fences. And you will be surprised if you've never fooled with them at what an animal can fit through. I have tried for years to get a creep feeder to work in our barn. And if she can get her horns through there, I've got does that will get through there. When I get it down small enough that she can't, usually the kids I want in there can't get in there either. So I've got to lower the height and keep the width narrow and do some other things to keep it done. But again, that 14-day cycle, 
Uh, longer rest periods are usually needed to help reduce the amount of parasite load on that pasture. Usually 80 to 120 days is what the parasitologists keep telling us. And it depends on weather conditions. The parasite we're concerned about is a roundworm, it's a nematode. And it depends on moisture to first of all break it out of that pellet once it hatches. And it needs that moisture to go up the plant. But because of this, in a normal rotation system, it can't get but about four to six inches up that plant stem, up that grass stem. So again with rotation, when we keep that great average grazing height up, we can help reduce that exposure. Now I've had a lot of people tell me, oh yeah, just keep them grazing above six inches. I keep telling them I can't find the height adjustment. Every goat I have will find a spot with something they like and graze it into the ground no matter how fast we're rotating them. I cannot set six inch minimum height, grazing height on my goats. So we keep them moving, we give a good rest period as long as we can, and we are keeping our average grazing height, starting them out around eight to ten inches, Keep getting it down there into the, about that six inch, about the time we pull them off. It's usually in our seven day rotation we've been looking at, it's usually been averaging around four inches, four to five inches when we move the animals off, okay? So we are getting some of this and we are avoiding those parasites that way. As I mentioned, we have been doing a project and I want to cover this. Remember I said that goats like and sheep, they like a variety. They like some different things in their diet. We've been doing a rotation, uh, this was our third year and looking at a seven day rotation, seven day on, uh, what was it, 52 days off, or 56 days off, sorry, 56 days off. The two fields, uh, basically when I, in about 2007, 2008, we took a six acre field and divided it into three two acre paddocks. I used two of those up until the time we started this, they were just in our normal production rotation of moving animals through. I did not have, know the system was in place if it was there, but I found out this year about the pasture evaluation program that UK Forge offers. I took advantage of that. I asked them to come out. They came out on May 1st and on July 25th. And then I got behind when classes started and I was going to ask them to come out when we pulled the goats off at the end of the year. I got behind when classes started, forgot to give them a call, and missed that opportunity. So that's my fault, okay? I'm hoping to work with them better whenever we get done it. When we start again next year, make sure I got some other people involved. We get all of this done. They've offered to train my people. I would rather have them keep coming if they're willing to because they've already been trained and more consistent. But what I want to show you here, when I look at the continuous versus the seven day rotation, remember these fields pretty much started at the same. But I'm not going to say this is scientific research at this point because I didn't take the samples three years ago to verify what they were. But just look at this. In May, 15% difference in the amount of tall fescue with it being lower in the rotation versus the continuous. May 1st was the day before we started grazing these fields this year. We had more Kentucky bluegrass, more orchard grass, the weeds and the bare soil, what I've been told by them, and I looked at it, they count uh, plantain buckhorn, chickweed, and some of these other forbs that goats eat as weeds. Uh, the annuals are counted as bare ground. Remember, these people, this program was really set up for horse people. So they're looking at trying to get horse people to realize that you can't run 20 horses on two acres and have grass. So that's why some of these are the way they are. But what I want you to see is, even, you know, when you go down here to the July, we still have a good difference 
even have 23% Kentucky bluegrass there. It didn't really change. And they went through the whole field, all the two acres, not just looking at where the animals were were moving on that rotation. So this was throughout the field. Orchard grass dropped a little bit. But when I look at this, again, I, I can't do the, the analysis on it, but I see the rotation is maintaining that variation in even the cool season forages. Now, admittedly, this year was a very wet year. Our cool season forages grew better throughout the summer. But how many cattle people would like to have less fescue, more bluegrass and orchard grass in their fields? Through good grazing management, we can get there. Okay? Again, the white clover, they, they counted some of that. Some of the weeds also included the red clover, which we had overseed, we had frost seeded with red clover a good many years back. We need to do that again. And like I said, some of the bare soil here were some of our plants that are annuals that are in there. Uh, we just see a much better ground with the rotation versus the continuous. I started looking at the performance of the animals in here. And the first two years, it looked exactly like I expected it to. The rotation was doing better with average daily gain than the continuous. This year was the outlier year. If I throw this year in, I get a year by treatment interaction. I'm trying to figure that out, exactly what caused all of that, because uh, it wasn't, the difference wasn't what I expected it to be. So I've got to do some more examining of what went on there and what caused that. But we, we do see a little bit difference in performance, and it's usually better on our rotation. Uh, I think some of this is due to my concern, and I, some of the people here can probably help somebody figure this out. When we start this rotation, part of the reason I start it so late is because we usually start with does. So I've got kidding going on and some other stuff. Well, what happens is when I start at one end of that field and I've got nine sections, that bottom end is starting to mature out. And it's usually the last two or three sections are very mature by the time I get to it. The simple solution is go in and mow it. I've done that some years, and then it doesn't rain. Then I don't have forage, <laughs> okay? So that's a problem, but we are seeing some variation. This is getting, and again, I really, it's showing what I expected, but I can't quite test it yet. I want to cover this, this real quick. I believe a lot of cattle producers in this state are missing an opportunity. We see a lot of weeds in cattle pastures. They're using a lot of chemicals in mowing. There is the possibility of co-grazing sheep and goats with your cows and having them help this out. We did a project in Carter County a good many years ago. Some of the extension people remember Terry Hutchins. He started this project. Uh, what we saw was over three years, we saw a tremendous reduction in brambles and other broadleafs and weeds in the pasture in the lower and middle canopy heights with a corresponding about 30% increase in grass in that lower and middle canopy. So as a cattle producer, could you use an extra 30% grass on some of your pastures? Now these pastures had a lot of weeds in them. So I wouldn't say the direct corresponding to any pasture. But this was being achieved through co-grazing where the producer added one goat, one doe per cow on these fields. He didn't see a decrease. He actually saw some increase in his cattle production and because of the steep terrain he was dealing with, when they used the UK numbers to calculate what it would cost him to do chemical or mechanical weed control, he was covering more than the cost of raising the goats in his savings for weed control. 
So if you really start budging it out right and looking at what he would have had to pay versus what he was paying, the goats were pure profit. Okay? So grazing land management, I want to cut through this because I know we've got some, do have some time restrictions. One of the cautions is, especially with sheep, sheep are very sensitive to copper. If you are going to co-graze, you cannot use the same mineral or feed for cattle as or, or goats as you do with sheep. Uh, predator control is an issue. There are resistant species and both the are resistant breeds to parasites in both the goats and the sheep sheep side of things. Get some good animals. Make sure, just like anything else, think about it like you're buying stalkers. Make sure you get good animals. Keep them healthy. Select for that. There are good markets in the state. So proper grazing management is a key. Rotational grazing is really needed if you're going to be successful. And it's to keep the product productivity there. And it's to keep the variety there. And it's to help avoid those parasites. They prefer different, different forages than cattle. Sheep and goats have prefer that variety and prescribed grazing is one additional use for these species. So that prescribed grazing is where you go and you graze for somebody else or something. One of the things I see is there's possibility of somebody if you, with small ruminants, if they have a cattle producer as a neighbor, maybe helping them by grazing their stuff out, give your fields a break. I don't want, like I said, I don't want to keep you too long from, from lunchtime, but I will be around the rest of the afternoon if there are questions. So. Let's thank Jack for his presentation.